Welcome to 10 Things You Didn't Know in Elden Ring, and also some things you might not have realized have been patched. Sponsored by Project Orochi. Until very recently, there was a bug where if you used a flail's charge-up attack while wearing the deathbed dress, you would hit yourself in a slapstick kind of way. I had a data miner, King Boar, explain this to me. The reason this self-flagellation occurred was due to a unique interaction between the dress and flail. The charge attacks are designed to do slightly more damage each rotation, but instead of giving each rotation its own attack entry with slightly more damage, they chose to apply a special effect to the player that adds a flat amount of physical damage. Therefore, the area of effect hitbox of the dress's healing effect was given this flat amount of damage from the flail's special effect. I'm speaking mostly in past tense because this funny interaction was patched in the major 1.06 update that released in early August. It turns out the dress had a number of issues that needed to be fixed, including the fact that it alerted enemies when it wasn't supposed to. Of course we know there are ways to parry and deflect magical spells in Elden Ring, uses Ashes of War like Thop's Barrier and Carrion Retaliation. These shield infusions even counter thrown magical consumables like Cuckoo Glintstone and the Wraith Calling Bell. But do you know just how many projectiles work with a Storm Wall Ash of War? Not only can you parry and deflect away arrows, like the description says, you can even bounce firebombs into the sky like it's a game of golf. If the enemy throwing firebombs at you happens to be standing next to an incendiary barrel, that's their fault. With this Ash of War infused to your shield, you can parry away bone darts, throwing daggers, poison stones, explosive stones, crossbow bolts, and basically any arrows fired from something smaller than a ballista or a grape bow. Partial. Cannons are also a little bit too much. No. Don't work. Before patch 1.06, there was technically an armor so rare that it was impossible to get except through a bug. Revian showcased this discovery back in May. The Beast Champion set normally features a dark blue cape, yet if you alter the chest piece by removing the cape and then reverting the alteration while still wearing it, you would suddenly be wearing the otherwise unobtainable purple cape. This different color was temporary. If you took off the armor or warped to a site of grace, it would return to normal. So obviously I tried to replicate this glitch post patch 1.06 and as you can see, it has been fixed. However, I do hold on to the hope that future DLC might expand on the armor alteration system. It would be so great to recolor cloths and fabrics, maybe even have a few choices based on all the groups found around the lands between, like all the soldier sets representing the various factions. If not, it's a shame we might never see this purple cape again. But you know what you can still get some sick Elden Ring fashion? Project Orochi, today's sponsor, the streetwear clothing brand inspired by Japanese mythology and art. I have a direct appreciation for these designs because a lot of them are inspired by Dark Souls, Sekiro, Bloodborne and of course Elden Ring, basically all my favourite games. They have this really nice academia design based on the academy of Rea Lucaria and that area gave me goosebumps when I first saw it. Some designs are more subtle and minimalistic, like the Dark Moon tee. They do also have other products that aren't video game inspired. For example, this fisherman tee is really cool. It reminds me of that famous Japanese painting called The Great Wave, or the Ryu hoodie, a dragon for an even greater Japanese aesthetic. Shipping is free if you live in North America, so go over to their store to browse their collections, check out the different designs, but don't forget to use the discount code MAIDENLESS for 10% off the entire order. There are a total of seven walking mausoleums spread out through the lands between. You must access them to duplicate the remembrances from the demigods, lords and legends. To access them, you have to take down these huge stone turtles, either by attacking the curse marks on its legs or by jumping onto the upper platform and destroying the white marks there. Did you know there's an extremely easy way to bring it to its knees? You can just use any incantation with a good area of effect. A top contender would be Grail's Roar. The roar deals physical and slight magical damage in a wide area of effect, making it ideally suited to removing the curses. If your build doesn't fit that, the rejection incantation has a much more modest faith requirement of 12 and effectively does nearly the same thing. For the mausoleums where the curse marks are out of reach, you could still strike their legs to stop them moving and then just jump up there as previously mentioned, or simply position yourself nearby to shoot the targets from a distance. It's great target practice. For 
for the first time ever in a game like this, FromSoft has crafted a vast collection of map fragments, which make up a visual depiction of the lands between. What you might not know is these hand-drawn designs have been modified countless times in a series of patches and updates to the game. Some of the major and minor ones have been tracked by users such as Illusory Wall, and it's very interesting to see that the map has faults and issues that needs to be addressed over time just like any other game issue. One of the most famous changes is the road to the hidden Jarburg village. There is in fact no direct path, the map is a lie, you need to jump down the cliff ledges to get there. I remember recording footage at the time and everyone was leaving messages to show they got tricked. However, this trickery ended during patch 1.05. If you check the map it now accurately shows the inaccessible coastline. One section I remember thinking needs to be fixed during my first playthrough was in the northeast section of Liurnia. Where it joins the big wall of the frenzied flame village there's a cliff that is correctly marked, but as it curves down it loses its precision and ends up making no sense. It looks like you should be able to just walk over to the Church of Inhibition from here, but in reality that's not possible. Funnily enough, this section still hasn't been changed as of patch 1.06, so watch this space. There are 6 torches in Elden Ring, 7 if you include the Torch Pulse Spear. Let's shine some light on the Sentry Torch. This torch reveals invisible enemies and concealed assassins. This effect occurs when held in either hand, or placed on your back while two-handing something else. It even works if your summoned partner uses the torch, to reveal the invisible enemies for everyone else. However, the real fact about this torch is it does way less than you might expect. It does not reveal invisible floors, or illusory walls, except in the singular instance of the illusory walls in the sage's cave. And even then, it only opens the walls at this location for lore reasons. The torch says it allows the bearer to see assassins cloaked in veils, and this cave is a black knife assassin hideout. It sadly does not work on the invisible scarabs. Someone wrote on the wiki that you can reveal players who use the concealing veil talisman in PvP. I don't believe this was ever correct. The talisman essentially works like the obscuring ring in Dark Souls 3. It makes the wearer invisible to enemy players at a distance, so it's proximity based. You will see them when you run within range whether you have the sentry torch or not, it makes no difference. This is the same for Mimic Veil Concealment, it has no effect. I even went a bit overboard and checked if it revealed Unseen Blade Sorcery. The Unseen Blade spell cloaks your weapon with invisibility and the torch does nothing. There seems to be a running argument as to whether these are giant lobsters or giant crayfish, and I don't know my crustaceans well enough to say for sure. But either way, they're up there as one of the most hated enemies in Elden Ring. A lot of people say they just avoid them entirely. They're very quick, vast amounts of health, and hard to stagger, and they don't really give good rewards either. However, did you know they actually have a weak point in their underbelly? So much so that any attack which thrusts from underneath is a perfect strategy against them. Try out the giant hunt Ash of War, stick it on some big sword, it's quite a surprising weakness. There's a chance, a very low chance, but a chance nonetheless that you end up recognising one of these red knights, perhaps as one of your very own characters. The Great Jar in Dragon Barrow lays a challenge before you in the form of three red summon signs. Defeat these three knights of the Great Jar in one life, and you win the challenge. If you're having trouble just getting to this location each time you die, it's a bit of a trek to the nearest grace, so a nice tip is to save and quit after running past to de-aggro the nearby giants. It's now known that the three randomised builds that you face each time you attempt the challenge, they come from other players who have successfully obtained the Great Jar's arsenal while playing online. The same thing goes for Fear's champions in the Deep Root Depths. These NPC enemies really are the uploaded builds of other real players. You can tell they're real, because some of the builds don't always seem completely functional. Sometimes the opponent doesn't seem to have the requirements to use their spells. Or they keep applying the same useless buffs over and over again. I have even heard of a case where someone faced an opponent with no weapons, but I actually think that's just other online players trying to be kind and giving you a free fight. Of course you're going to see a lot of Moonveil katanas and bleed builds despite the nerfs, but honestly I think the variety is good, it's there for the most part. 
it's really interesting to get a sneak peek at how other players are putting together their builds. All the pieces of the old aristocrat set are dropped by these wandering old nobles. This includes the old aristocrat shoes, and I'm sorry about this fact I'm about to share with you. I really wasn't sure how to present this one, but if I had to see it, you now have to see it, and you can't deny it's an unusual detail. So if you equip these old aristocrat shoes for some unknown reason, it rearranges your pickle, one might say. Doesn't work on female models, perhaps unsurprisingly. This could be because they made the decision to shrink the loincloth at some point in development, but then forgot to add this change to the aristocrat shoes. If that was the case though, it's funny that this has not been patched, but the purple cape was. There is an option in the game menu called manual attack aiming. It was there in the previous Souls games, and what it allowed was directional control of your heavy attacks while locked onto enemies. It can be a useful technique sometimes to prevent strafing and backstabs. For some reason, this setting doesn't work in Elden Ring. I should mention this is for strength weapons, as you can see all the heavy weapon attacks rigidly lock you towards your opponent when locked on. Here I'm attacking while pulling left and right on my movement stick, but my attacks only ever go straight toward the enemy. That's how it is, they're all the same, except one unusual weapon, the ringed finger. This weapon skill in particular, Claw Flick, is the only one that allows you to alter the direction of your heavy attack while locked on if you have the manual attack aiming option enabled. Obviously, just to be clear, you can still perform these directional strength attacks just by unlocking. I think most players just unlock when they want more precise control anyway. But even so, it's funny to have a menu setting that's essentially useless. But hey, at least now we can say FromSoft gave us the finger. If you learned anything new, please subscribe. We'd love to have you here. Bye.